It's Luke here for Simbox. Delighted this morning to be joined by trainer, promoter, manager, all-round boxing guru, Joe Gallagher. Joe, how are we doing? Yeah, not too bad. How are you? Yeah, all good, thanks. All good. Uh, thanks for your, your time this morning. Uh, very busy start to the year. So, yeah, really look forward to getting your opinion on a, a few things. Yeah. So, Joe, let's go straight into it. Uh, we're on the back of a, a huge night at Manchester Sky Sports box office, headlined by Liam Smith and Chris Eubank. It was a, a spectacular finish to a great card. Liam Smith coming away with the stoppage victory in round four. Joe, I know you was there. You took part in a lot of the fight week festivities, shall we say. You was there for a raucous atmosphere at the arena. What was your initial reaction when when the fight was waved off and Liam Smith had stopped Chris Eubank? Yeah, it was where we were sat. We were doing um, comms for BBC Five Live. I thought before Chris Eubank had gone over on his ankle or he'd slipped with water in the corner or whatever until we could see on the monitor and um, the shots that he put together and then the way that he got up and... Um, like I said, walked across the ring to Victor Lachlan. He looked like he was uh, on Dean Skate in Manchester coming out of Witherspoons. And uh, at that point, listen, I thought Victor Lachlan was going to stop it there. Um, but he didn't give him the benefit of the doubt. And then Liam came out, met him with a right hand. And uh, Eubank tried to cling on to his waist, but he was in no man's land. He was on Queer Street, wasn't he? And uh, yeah, listen, it was a, a fantastic win for Liam Smith. And I think the shock in the arena was that... No one whatsoever thought that was going to happen. A lot of people beforehand said, oh, if there was a stoppage, it'd be Eubank. If it was a win on points, it'd be Liam Smith or Liam Smith to late down the straight. But no one envisaged that. And there was nothing to suggest in, in, in Liam's career. I wouldn't say Liam's career, but in the big fights, when you've seen them recently with Fowler and everything else, it takes a while to get going. And a lot of people thought after... Round three, Eubank was up 2-1. Eubank came out in two, arrived, and round three started letting the shots go. Um, but like you say, Liam Smith um, caught him some good shots. And the good thing about Liam, he can go through gears and he can go through punches and bunches and he puts them together well. Um, and he'll just carry the momentum. He may miss, but he'll come back with the left hook and then the right uppercut and then the left uppercut and the left hook. And there were two great shots that did it. And obviously the right hand um, that he finished him with was a good shot as well. So ended up high high up on the temple. So it was um it was a good stoppage for Liam Smith. I, I thought um on the build up to the fight and, and the ring walk, you could just see with Liam Smith. It was, he, he was Liam was having moments to himself in the ring walk from the changing room. And I said in commentary, once Liam Smith hits that platform, I said you'll see the lines light up. He'll look at it and go, yeah, this is what it's all about. Come on, let's have it. And you could see him. As he's walking to the ring, so like, yeah, come on, let's have it. You're having it. Do you understand? Where I, I just thought Eubank Jr. was a bit pensive on, on the backstage. And then when he got onto the platform, he didn't have that uh, glint in his eye that he usually had. And uh, I just thought his corner were very subdued. You know, Eubank Jr. usually comes, I wouldn't say mob-handed, but his dad's usually there and a couple more. But they were very subdued. There was no... I said another interview, it was like Chris Eubank Jr. was going to the guillotine. It, it, it wasn't um, confident, it didn't seem a confident corner, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, Eubank Jr., I, I see someone else, George Grove, saying he felt a bit sorry for him. And this thing he got in the ring, and now I know Eubank Jr. likes to play the villain. And uh, But when he looked across the ring and you had Liam Smith absolutely glaring and snarling at him, and then his team behind him and his brothers behind him, and there's 20,000 in the arena. and I don't know, just for that moment, I just thought maybe a sense of reality had kicked in them for, for Chris. Um, and then the first early rounds, but Liam Smith moved his head very well round one, stopped moving it two and three, but then came out four and started moving it. And that caused Eubank to miss and put a bit of uncertainty to, to his work. And um, Liam trapped him in the corner and finished him. But uh, what a crowd, what a ring walk uh, and what a win for Liam Smith. Um, where Eubank Jr. goes now, Um we're all have to wait and see. I think Eubank Jr.'s pride and his ego um, will most probably want the rematch straight away. I've said it and others that people might he'll say, well, I was 50% of that and it didn't work, so I'll be 100% next time. He'll put a spin on it in some way or another. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's great for Liam. Um, but, but the other side, when you look at Eubank Jr., you just think, can't help feel... I wouldn't say sorry for him, but... He has had a tough time. He's been through an awful lot outside of the ring as well as inside of the ring. And he's mostly really laid there. We were in the arena going, wow, what happened? 
think Eubank Jr. must be woke up Sunday morning going, wow, what happened there? Or what's happened to my career these last four or six months? This wasn't in the script. Did I run a cat, cat over or walk under a ladder? It's, it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, he's had a tough time, the lad. You're not just playing do- uh, devil's advocate here, Joe. I uh, don't want to take anyone, anything away from Liam Smith. And this is solely based on what you see on social media. Have you seen this story doing the rounds of, of maybe a, a, an elbow catching Eubank from Liam Smith, whether it was intentional or, or, or not? But when he, he went to unload that combination, it does look like there could be potentially an elbow that's caused a well under Eubank's eye. Have you seen anything of that on, on social media? Yeah, I've seen that social media. But boxing is boxing. You're in a fight. Do you understand? Heads go in, elbows goes in. Do you understand? They're up close to lift their heads up. And Liam Smith threw a shot. And you, you go back and look at the old school fighters back in the 50s and 60s, Rocky Marciano, them type of fighters, Sugar Ray Robinson. They all threw shots and they all follow on. And if they miss the elbow catches, then how many times boxers are, are stopped with injuries where they've been caught overhead? And them things happen. So I don't think there's no intent or no malice with it. Do you know what I mean? It, and Smith threw a shot and he followed through with it. And that's boxing. It's it's not nothing new. You, you see that years gone past with all the old great fighters. So, um, yeah, it's, it's something or nothing that it's uh, trying to make something that really, really wasn't anything. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think maybe that in, in weeks to come, you know, boxing loves to spin a narrative and, and storylines and whatnot. If Chris Eubank does go down the lines of looking for a rematch, the fact that he said he was at 50% for this fight, he'll then say he's going to come in at 75% or 100%. This elbow issue was it, wasn't it, uh, a cause for the stoppage. Do you think that all builds into a narrative that Chris Eubank might spin for a, a potential rematch with Liam Smith? We know he's got the clause. Yeah, I'd I, I, I be disappointed if he tried to use the elbow because it wasn't an elbow that hit him with the left uppercut that lifted his head up. Um, and like you're saying, the left hook that absolutely nailed him as well. So it's um, a bit, bit poor form on that. I, I, I think they're really clutching straws. I think Chris Eubanks are better than that. And um, I, yeah, I think the people in and around him would, wouldn't advise him to go down that route. Joe, we know Chris Eubanks very strong minded, maybe some may say stubborn uh, for large parts of his career. He's actually trained himself. He's had his dad in and around camp and Ronnie Davis in and around camp. But Roy Jones seems to be the first full-time trainer that he's worked with. And you've you've been in there against uh, Chris Eubank with Marcus Morrison and, uh, you know, you pitted your wits against Roy Jones. But to a lot of outsiders looking in, it's not really a partnership that's working. Um, maybe Eubank's too long in the tooth to be trying to box like Roy Jones. We all know there's only one Roy Jones. Do you think this is a partnership that com- could come to an end on the back of this result? Um, it could do. It's also done a bit of work with Adam Booth in the past and a couple of other trainers, but they, they haven't really worked out. Um, they, they, they seem to have a relationship. They seem to get each other. I think when Eubank was out there in America and Pensacola, uh, working with Chris and living for a while, they seem to have connected and got each other. I just think um, Liam Smith's style um, was all wrong for uh, Eubank Jr., um, for that type of uh, fight, very much in the same way you could say Tava was for Roy Jones. Does that make sense? Is it like, boom, the style was just all wrong. Um, where Liam Williams' style was good for Eubank Jr. came in and walked on to shots where I said it beforehand, Liam Smith's boxing IQ, people always used to say, just walks forward, typical Gallagher fight, hands up, blah, blah, blah. And he isn't, his boxing IQ is very good. He's got good timing, good shot selection. And you're seeing that the other night, they'll put pressure on to make you do stuff, make mis- make mistakes. And uh, if you do make them, Liam will punish you. And um, you go through Liam's resume and his career. His fight with Jamie Mungia was a brilliant fight and he acquitted him very himself very well and had good success in that fight, as he did with Canelo, as he did with all his wins as well at domestic uh, and, and world level. So it's... Uh, He's a very talented fighter. I just don't. I just most probably thought maybe they overlooked him because of his fights with Fowler at one five four and Vargas. Where I always said that light middleweight, Liam's time at light middleweight was finished. When if I thought I think last time he made one five four with me was with Sam Egerton, and I didn't think he looked good that night. And I said to Liam, "You need to move to one sixty. He moved to one sixty. Had a good win in America. Had a good win in Mexico." And I was just like, right, your energy levels are back, your snarling, your boxing IQ. So when people are on about the weight and for this, I was thinking, in a problem, Liam's been 160, Liam has fired his brother, Callum Smith, Callum Johnson, uh, Mark, oh, Mark Efron. 
all big lads in the gymnasium. This isn't got faced him. He's come in after being on holiday and battered European champions at middleweight up, do you know what I mean? Within five, six rounds that, that have come in for sparring. So weight was never the problem for Liam Smith. And I'd, I'd like him to stay at 160 now because I, I, you could just see a totally different Liam Smith in the ring of the night than he did when he was in against with Fowler and Vargas. His energy levels, his spite. I, I think now with the win, the confidence in his punching ability will give him that much. And listen, there's a triple G fight there, but there's, there's other fights there as well. And I hope he can go on and um, win a second world title. But the names out there, like you say, there's Brooke, Triple G, Eubank. They're all big fights, and I think they're all trying to get that Anfield date. But as far as Eubank and, and Jones Jr., will we see them working together again? Well, certain people have gone in on, on them, haven't they? Um, on Eubank and on uh, Roy Jones Jr., I think I think that maybe maybe I think I think there's a possibility we could see them still sticking it together. Um, and Roy Jones will be like, right, I need to put this right. My credibility as a trainer and Eubank Junior will want to give Roy Jones Junior the op- opportunity to do that with him. So um, whether that he takes himself off to America or not, I don't know. Joe, I just want to get a touch on uh, Joe McNally. He was training Liam Smith on on Saturday night. I'm not sure again if you've seen it, but in the moment. Immediately after the stoppage, Chris Eubank, he didn't know where he was. And I think he tried continuing fighting with Liam Smith. And it was John McNally that, that put his arms around Eubank and, you know, kind of saved him from himself, if you like, because he was totally disorientated. You've been in many a big fights. You see the, the poster behind you there of celebrating with Anthony Crawler after the Barroso win. You've been there with the euphoria of a win and, and the disappointment of a loss. Yeah, just a word on John McNally there and the you guys as trainers, you see things totally different, both in terms of a game plan and in terms of a situation in that split second for him to forget the celebrations and to protect the opponent. Yeah, no, exactly. Listen, Joe Mac, I, I've known him for years, Joe McNally, a good amateur, good pro, trained with me for a while when he was I think, considering a comeback and I have huge time and respect for him. So um, he's a class act, Joe, and uh, I was really pleased for him and Declan, for, for getting the win and um, keeping control of Liam because Liam can be like that. And like Joe said afterwards, Liam went missing round three just with, with his uh, the big bollocks on him, like thinking he knows best. Joe, meanwhile, he's in there. And Joe got a grip of him again and, and Liam did that. But yeah, listen, Joe, Mac, when you're in there, you see things. And sometimes, like you say, you, you see fighters hurt and you always try and calm them down and make sure they're all right before the celebrations can begin. Um, but to keep a head like that in the atmosphere that it was and, and, and the moment of Europia, um, euphoria, it's um, great that John Mack kept a cool head. And he's seen that of Chris and people say, oh, they were too slow to get in the rings. Eubank's team, I'll give Ronnie Davis a, a bit of thing. He's 76. He can't be the quickest up the stairs, can it? Um, I think Roy could have somersaulted over the ropes, but listen, the most probably sat there in shock, not believing what's happened. So, uh, and most probably thinking Chris wasn't really that much hurt. But yeah, listen, fair play to Joe Mack. Um, full credit to him. He, he, he's a, a talented up and coming coach. And um, like I said, that, that, that's a good win for him and his stable, which is going into a big 2023 20, year for them. Yeah, absolutely. Joe, before we move on, um, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of, of Team Smith or Team Eubank. Ideally, where did each man go um, in the aftermath of that fight? What do you think is the most ideal route for both? Um, I think Liam Smith, um, it'll be Anfield. They've really got to try and do Anfield. Anfield, I'm sure, them talking to them, they're only going to have some, uh, not many dates. That sun's in my eyes, uh, many dates. So I think um, they're going to have to do something early June, end of May, early June, because I'm sure Anfield and, one, and Klopp will want the pitch relayed and settled and everything for the season, which will be the middle of August. So um, that event, uh, I'm sure, would have to happen in around that time. Now, whether it is a Eubank rematch and he rolls back into town and he has his dad in tow this time and that's it, or Triple G, um, or Kell Brook. Kell Brook's a, a, a good domestic fight. There's history there, again, with the sparring. Um, obviously, uh, Kell Brook um, elbow put the split in Liam's head so he couldn't spar for Canelo. So, and I think they've got footage of that as well. So, th- th- there's a narrative for all of them. And obviously, with Triple G, I think everyone loves to see Triple G over here again. Um, people at most would think, does he still have it at age 40? Is it the right timing? And that would again be a, a, a huge win for Liam Smith if he could pull it off. So, um, 
I'm sure the team's got to sit down and think what's best for Liam. But Liam's in a good place. There's three options, and I'm sure there's a couple more out there. Um, I saw Eubank Junior. Does he get straight back on the horse and go and right the wrong? Um, if he can do, or does he go off and have a fight in America or a warm up fight, and then look at then fighting um, Liam Smith at the back end of the year, either early um, like bonfire night in around that time. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Liam Smith would have gone and won a world title. Then you do the rematch with Eubank. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what Eubank Junior does. Maybe a comeback fight and then goes into who, Liam Smith again, which would be a big fight at the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Joe, we had a, a quiet start to the end and it booms into life as it tends to does with boxing. Uh, we had Eubank Smith and we go into another huge fight this weekend, Unified Light Heavyweight World Champion Arthur Peturbiev defends his titles against Anthony Yard. Joe, this has a, a real big fight feel to it, in, in in my opinion. What's your thoughts on the fight? No, it's listen, it's a great fight, isn't it? I think Yard, what is it, 23 no, 22 knockouts, 21 knockouts, something like that. Um, with BTB of 18 fights. Adam? He's got that one loss to, to Lyndon Arthur on his record. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, it's 80, um, BTB of 18 fights, 18 wins, 18 knockouts, done everything as an amateur, been in with the best, um, fought Usyk, fought bigger men, beat bigger men. Um, and I, I just, I think uh, BTB have showed um, in his last fight with Joe Smith Jr. that he's still improving. I thought his boxing skill set last time was very good. His feet were on point. His shot selection were very good. And he showed he was just more than a, a brawler. He does have a very good boxing brain. And you need to have a good boxing brain to be in with the likes of Usyk. And at an amateur level, he's got a good pedigree. Anthony Yard didn't really have much of an amateur pedigree. I don't think he had many amateur fights, if he had any at all, but went straight into not long into the pro game. So... Um, He's had an opportunity before with Kovalev in Russia. This time he's at home, he's in familiar surrounds. Frank Warren and Queensbury have a habit of getting the right fighter at the right time. We've seen that years ago with Ricky Hatton and Costa Tazu. Um, and this this could be it. Um, yeah, the, 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 he's a big man, Anthony Yard. He's a big man. But so is BCB. Anthony Yard uh, has got the strength. Be interesting to see how he makes the weight. Um because he's been at that weight a long time and he's growing. Um, so we'll see down, we've seen Kovalev down the straight where they still have the gas tank. He started very quick in the rematch with Lyndon Arthur, got his game going uh, and got the shots. Some people are mostly saying, well, Anthony, I'd go out there for six rounds and give it your best, throw everything at it, roll the dice. And if you get it, you get it. If you don't, well, listen, you'll come out in a blaze of glory. Or you just go in there and you be patient and you pot shot and you're frustrated, be to behave. You hold them, you're up close. You try and catch him with the short shots on the inside, like Callum Johnson did. And uh, Anthony Yard's quite good at that. He throws little short shots, which have sometimes devastating effects. He knocks people out. Um, and he adds always a short up or a short left hook. And it's what Callum Johnson put him over. So it's quite dangerous up close with his shoulder and round, but um, B2B as a, as, a, as a tremendous jab, a very hard jab, a jab knock a horse over, um, and his pet shots the overhand right. Very much like Eubank Smith last week, we all expected one thing, and it ended up another. So, we're all expecting a knockout this week, one way or another, and it could end up being a 115-114 scorecard, uh, um, and a controversial one. It, it's... Um, it's, it, it's, it is a good fight, and I'm glad it's on, and I'm glad it's over here. And um, I hope everyone tunes in and it gets the attention that it deserves. Whoever wins, I think the WBC have said, like, Callum Smith's the mandatory. There again is another fight. Um, I'd like to see that. But before that, I'd really, if B2BF wins, I want to say B2BF, Bivol, I really do. And I think... That set the tone for the best fight and the best this year. To understand, hopefully, we get Spence Crawford, them type of fights. I'm sure Callum Smith would appreciate a little bit of step aside money while that happened, and then fight the winner of all of it for all the belts. But for boxing and the sake of boxing, we really want to see the best fight, the best this year. Otherwise, boxing's got to go more and more in, into a niche sport, and we've got to bring the fans out and um, do that. Joe, uh, I can't not put you on the spot now. You've mentioned that fight there, but Terbi, I've and Bivol, if that fight was to happen in the middle of 2023, who would you make favourite Bitebiev against Bivol? Uh, Bitebiev, I think Bitebiev only because of um, what he's done, what he's achieved, who he's fought. 
Um, I know Bibbles had a career best performance um, over the likes of um, Canelo, but when you look at familiar com- common opponents, um, B- Bibble beat Joe Smith Jr. on points. I think Joe Smith caught him, I think, or got a reaction out of him late on. Uh, BTBF dominated him, and uh, I think at the moment you have to go back to BTBF. But Bibble that turns up like against Canelo and puts in a boxing class master, that'd be a, a great fight. But they're the, they're, they're, they're the questions we're answering this year. Let's get the heavyweights done. Tyson and Usyk, right, that's who's number one. Number one at light heavyweight, him, BTBF or Bivol, right, that's sorted. Well away, Spence scored, right. And just let's get it all done. And at the end of the year, he's going, no, he's number one. He's on. And let's have at least four or five in a division where it's clear that he is the number one and the best has fought the best. And um, that's what's got to attract um, the, the next generation of, of fans because we are struggling with the next generation from 14 to 18, 21-year-olds to bring them into boxing because they're so involved in MMA and UFC and now Misfits and uh, YouTube. R- r- boxing really has to show everyone. Because, like I said, it's, last weekend there was no world titles on the line. It was just a good fight between two good fighters. That was a 50-50. And it shows that we can do it. And boxing at its best is very hard to beat. But we need to do more of it. And... Um, and it's got to start with people that at the top they've got to fight each other. Yeah, absolutely. Joe, I want to go off on a, a bit of a tangent there because you mentioned uh Canelo. Um just briefly, Canelo Bivol, does that rematch happen in twenty twenty three? And if so, is it, do you think it happens at one sixty eight for the, the undisputed belts there? No, I, I like I said, yeah, I, I don't want Bivol just to fight um B to be if he fights Canelo, then I think the rematch should be at one seven five. That's that's Bivol's thing. And I think Coming so so if Bibble comes down to one six eight and Canelo beats him at one six eight, it's one one. Where we got to have the catchweight? Where we got to have the rubber match? Do you understand this? I don't know. Bring, bring, bringing a fight down to one six eight, I think it'd be a struggle for Bibble to come down to one six eight, and I can understand that. But Dimitri Bibble, he's in the driving seat. He's got the win, and there's fights out there for him. And B to B F is a huge fight for him, and I think. I think promoters need to get together and get that fight made, providing he comes through at the weekend. Now, if he doesn't and Yard wins, you've got to have Yard versus Callum Smith. That's a huge domestic fight, North, East, South, and um, I'm sure Anfield or whatever football team Yard, I think it's Arsenal, wasn't it? Emirates, Frank will be trying to get that there in a, in a summer fight. So whichever way, it, it, it's got to be good. Whoever wins that fight, they've got to be in big fights next. Joe, we talk about big fights that are happening and there's a potential for, for a huge year for a certain member of your stable in Natasha Jonas, the unified super welterweight or light middleweight, whichever way you want to call it, champion of the world. Um, for so long, it seemed that she was destined to be put on the, the scrap heap. You know, no disrespect, it seemed like she'd been discarded by some of the major promoters, but what a year she had. Three fights, three world titles, three victories. And it seems now, Joe, heading into 2023, that the world is her oyster. And there's a certain Clarissa Shields that that fight seems close. Can you share any information on that? Yeah, listen, there's been talks of uh, Clarissa's team, as there has been with other fighters in their teams. Um, it's an Natasha had a fantastic year, 2022. Two of them world titles, you mentioned. She won the space of 10 weeks, the WBC, and then nine weeks later, she was winning um, the, the Ring Magazine and the, the IBF belt. So a fantastic year for her. Um, gone to Sports Personality of the Year awards. When you look at the end of the year, she was voted Female Fighter of the Year by some people, runner-up, and Clarissa was Female Fighter of the Year. So, listen, it, it's a good fight. It, it's it's a fight that I think a lot of people will be interested in. Um, I've seen positive comments coming from Clarissa's side on social media here, from Mark Taffet and Salita, um, that they're really interested in, in the fight as well. And judging by uh, the, the, the feedback, what you see in social media, I think it's one that, people will be excited about. I think um, Sky last year had their first ever female card. And I think this is a headline act for them to do a second female card. I don't think you could really sit on one and just say box ticked and move on. I think it needs to continue. And I think um, you've got the right dance partners to make it here. I'm sure there's some good fights out there in the world that they could put on on the undercard. Um, yeah, so it it would be good. And, and Natasha has always wanted to challenge herself. You've seen that. She went against Terry Harper's in the dog, Katie Taylor. 
Um, and now, as I said, she's not back down from anyone. So it could be Clarissa. It could be a, a defence of one of the world titles next. Um, we'll just wait and see. I know the Anfield day. Um, her ears are pricked up on that one. She'd want to dance out on the, the Anfield pitch there with that one. Um, so, yeah, there's lots going on. Lots of talks, lots of meetings. But um, 2023 looks a, a very good year for Natasha. Joe, with a potential fight of, of Natasha Jonas and Clarissa Shields being so you know so seriously in consideration, what's your understandings of a, a Shields Savannah Marshall rematch? Because from what we heard, Savannah Marshall was going to activate that rematch. So where does she fit in in the mix there with the the Clarissa Shields situation? From your understanding, well, I, 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 that's what, well, I can't really comment on what Savannah and her team are doing. All I'm dealing with is Clarissa's manager Mark Taffet. And negotiations that we're talking about, um, and there's a window of opportunity for Clarissa to fight before the middle of April, before she goes off to do is it PFL uh, or MMA stuff in in the summer, uh, June, um, and then she'd be available then in, in in the fall after that. So I I don't know what Clarissa's plan is. I'm just in and Savannah. That isn't a, a conversation of at all. We're working on it as an Natasha Jonas, Clarissa Shield, and. When would it be able to fit in, in in the schedule this year, whether it be before June or the back end of June? So um, they're the type of discussions. But as far as Savannah, I, I don't know about that. No problem, Joe. Uh, as always, you're, you're, you're running a busy, uh, successful uh, stable down at, at Gallagher's Gym. I just want a couple of words, if we can, before we close up on, on your fighters. Uh, I think we'll go through them one by one. No doubt I'll probably miss a couple off, so you can pick me up on that. Uh, first and foremost, Paul Butler. Coming off the back of that stoppage loss to Nayo Inoue, one of the pound for pound best box on the planet, and in an undisputed fight, a historic moment for Paul Butler. Joe, where's Butler's head at heading into the new year? Yeah, no, listen, Paul's in a good place. He's uh, he's going to take a, a bit of a holiday coming up. Then when he comes back, I think he's got to come back. He's got to have another go. Um, and I think it'd be good for him to have a go now, then belts of a cage, to try and get him a shot. And uh, an attempt at him to become a, a three-time world champion, which would be great for him and for the area that he lives in. And um, he, he showed a good boxing IQ in his fight with his, uh, against a new way. He stuck to a game plan. He had moments in the fight. And um, I was really pleased because when the fight was made, everyone was saying, Paul Butler, rest in peace, he got killed. Then people in the trade saying Butler won't last a round, won't go past rounds, which I just thought was shocking. Um, but the fact that he went 11 rounds and then they complained that he went 11 rounds and saying he didn't have an appetite well if you look at Paul's counter punch he landed some good shots we had him where we wanted a new way but the, the certain shots didn't come off but he quitted himself well and um, some people will say I'm not thinking but Jack Massey the other night went in there and survived and didn't get criticism he got praised for going 10 rounds with Joseph Parker Jr yet we were one of the best in the world, and as good as he knew he was, it took him 11 rounds to catch up with him. So, yeah, but listen, Paul Butler, he's um, he'll be back soon. Uh, Charlie Edwards, where are we up to with, with Charlie, former world champion? He's looking to get back into the mix. Any news on, on Charlie? Yeah, no, Charlie, listen, Charlie's training out in Portugal. He's just trying to sort some uh, things out at the moment. They should be all sorted now out in the next few weeks, and then hopefully Charlie will have a, a good 2023. Uh, Marcus Morrison coming off the back of that British title defeat. Is he looking to get back into the mix in 2023? Yeah, he is. He's back in the ring, Mark. Back in the ring, back in the gym. He's back in the gym. He's um, training. And um, we're looking at, like I said, getting Marcus back in and having a shot at the British title again. Uh, we know we got the, the Kieran Farrell show on Feb 10th. So you got Clark Smith and Colin McGowan and, and Sean Yaxley all on that card. Yeah, and Callum Thompson. So uh, we've got four on. I think Callum Thompson's got to be a good year for him. He's 5-0 and oh now. Um, he's with Frank Warren. I think if we're getting five, six fights this year, we'll be 10, 11 and 0 oh by the end of the year. Clark Smith had three fights three months in three months and he's out again now. And then um, same again, we want him to get six fights this year. He'll end the year on 9-0 and oh, and they'll both be looking then at regional or English title mix. You know what I mean? Going into 2024, Sean Yaks there. He's improving all the time. He, he really has started 2023 in the gym really good. He, he's um, improving. He's sparring very well. And um, I'm looking at him a couple more fights and he should start getting into the British title scene as well. He's uh, he's really coming on. And the same with McCall and McGowan, English titles, that type of level. That They're all just bubbling along nicely, do you understand? And waiting for the phone to ring and uh, 
all four of them got to get out, get wins under the belt. Um, Jose Burton, obviously, he had a win there on the Tyson Bill just before Christmas. Got to try and get him out sooner, get him involved in a big fight in the cruiserweight division. Um, that'd be good for him. Um, who else? Uh, Natasha Jones just spoke about. Mark Heffron. Yeah, he's um, he's well. in the gym training, Mark Heffron. He had a good fight last year. A good year last year. Three fights, three wins, three knockouts. And um, he, he's ranked now in the top 10 of the governing bodies. And we'll be looking for him to push on on the world stage, get involved in a, an international fight and then try and challenge for world honours somewhere along the line in 2023. Exciting year ahead, Joe. Always busy uh, in in the stable. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close off? It's always an enlightening chat with you, Joe. Yeah, no, no, not really. Just a, It's just a, another year. It's, a, like I say, a difference a year makes and uh, what it was with Natasha Jonas and I'm sure... I've got one or two that I'm quite confident in the gym this year that will all be sat here next year talking about their success of this year. So, um, but there's um, talking it and doing it are two different things. So we've just got to say less and just do more. Absolutely, Joe. Well, thank you for your time. I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Cheers. No problem. Nice to speak to you.